Let's talk a little bit about Unseen. I want to share with you a message that I'm crazy excited about because I've already seen in two other services how God is making so much life change. And I have no doubt that those of you joining us online as well, um, God's going to do some, some crazy awesome stuff in your life through this as well. I want to talk to you today. We've talked about our enemy. We talked about spiritual warfare. We talked about the Holy Spirit, all these unseen things in our life. And we kind of started off sort of like a scary sort of a story. And then we've, we've graduated into some other things. And, and so what I want to do is I want to talk to you about faith vision. I want to talk to you about what, it, what faith causes us to see. Now, the word faith is a, is a word we use a lot, right? We're in church. Church people use the word faith. Faith, 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 faith. We talk about faith. We, we'll use it in sentences like, well, you know what? Um, all we have is our faith. Or we're leaning into our faith. Or we need to be faithful. And, 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 and again, we're people of faith. We even use it as a defining factor, as our identity. Who are we? We're people of faith. And, and oh, in our house, we use it a lot because one of my daughter's names is Faith. So, but, but, but the word faith is constantly used. It's constantly thrown out. But let me ask you this question. I'm not going to, but what if? What if, for instance, I ask you to pull out your connection card and I ask you to write down your definition of faith? I mean, write it down, what, what you believe. I mean, a word that we use this much, a word that's, that's constantly being spoken in our church. And I ask you to write down the definition of it. How many of you believe that all of our definitions would be the same? Who thinks they'd be the same? Probably not. We'd probably get a bunch of different definitions, wouldn't we? Because, you know, one person would say, well, what is faith? Well, someone would say, well, it's belief in God. And, and you know, would that be correct? Yes. It, faith is, is ha- finding strength in God's promises. Is that true? Absolutely it is. Someone else might say, well, faith is, is my, my practice of how I pursue God. And, and is that true? It, it, yeah, certainly it could be. But the reality is this when it comes to faith. A word that's used a lot by us is used a whole lot by God. And anything that God says that often is something that we really ought to get our hands around. We really ought to get our arms around it. We ought to figure out what exactly God's saying when it comes to faith. Because the Bible says about faith, it says that it's impossible to please God without it. The Bible says that faith determines lots of things that God's going to do in your life. I mean, it's that level of word. It's that level of importance. And so you and I need to figure it out. And so if you've got your outlines, I'm going to encourage you to get these out because this is going to be something that I really, really believe later you're going to go back to. And you're going to say, I remember we talked about this and I need to go back and refresh because it's going to be a life application understanding. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, we're going to get... What I believe is not necessarily a definition. I don't think God was making a stab at defining faith as much as He was giving us a manifest. In other words, if you want to know what contents would be on the ship of faith, ship, ship of faith. Sometimes I slur my speech. I don't want you to walk out and go, that didn't sound very spiritual to me. Um, Boat, the faith boat. Um, If if you want to know what would be on it, what's the cargo that's on this, this boat you're going to find that this is the cargo, okay? So if you're on the boat of faith, this is the cargo on that boat. And here's what the writer of Hebrews chapter 11, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in other words, this is what God wants you to know about faith. It says, faith is, great, great start, the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things that we cannot see. And so I gave you an equation on your outline, and this equation will help you begin to put the parts together. And so we're going to start with faith. Faith equals what? Well, according to Hebrews chapter 11, it equals hope. Hope is one of the pieces of cargo that's on the the ship of faith. It's, it's it's, It's something that has to be there. Now, the problem with the word hope is, and again, we've got to look at this word, is we use this word differently in our English language than God uses it in the Bible. When we use the word hope, we'll say things like this. Well, I hope it works out. Man, I hope, I hope our marriage makes it. Or, yeah, I hope I get the promotion. Or, or I hope my health turns. So for us, the word hope is used very often where we would use some, a wishful thinking word. You know what I mean? We, we, we would use the word I wish in the same place that we would use the word I hope. But that's not the way the Bible references hope. In fact, when, when we say our hope is in Him, we're not saying I hope that Jesus is who He says that He is. No, we're saying my hope is in Him. That means my confidence, the assurance that I have, is in Him, Christ, the person, and who He has defined Himself as being. That's our hope. That's the kind of hope that the writer of the book of Hebrews is wanting us to get. He's wanting us to get that it starts, if you're going to have faith, it starts first of all with you believing, knowing, and understanding that God is exactly who that He says that He is. And that's really important. 
In a world that's filled with skeptics, a world that's filled with false ideas and all kinds of controversies and loaded with information, we need truth. And truth is, is that God is exactly who He said that He is. That's, that's first. If you're going to have faith, you have to know that God is who he, he says that He is. Now, He goes on to say that it's not only hope, but it's a confident hope. You know, the difference between hope and confident hope is this. I can have hope. And I can have a belief, I can have a, a psychological, mental understanding that God is who He says that He is. And then I can have a confident hope that not only do I believe that God is who He says that He is, but I believe it to a point to where it changes the way I behave. See, that's the reality of the kind of faith that you and I ought to have. We ought to have the kind of faith that not only affects us in the way we think, but it should affect us in the way we behave. In fact, if your faith doesn't change the way you behave, there's something wrong with your faith. Because the kind of faith that we're talking about here has hope that God is who He says that He is, but we have such confident hope in that that I live it out. I'm going to live differently. Then it goes on and He talks about assurance. And assurance is that, that knowledge, that understanding, that security that you and I have that what God has said, it's going to happen. A lady that radically changed my life... Um, I only knew her for a few short years, um, a lady named Del Strunkel. First time I met her, she came to a service that we were hosting. And that day, she had been diagnosed with cancer. That's why she was there. And she came up, and I had a chance to pray with her and love on her. And just over the next couple of years, as she bought the, fought the most valiant battle with cancer of anybody that I've ever seen, um, I just got to fall in love with a woman who was a woman of honor and a woman of faith and a woman of God. And it was towards the end of Dale's life. I was at her house. Um, I'd stopped by to visit. Um, at this particular point in her life, she's on hospice, um, very, very sick. And I remember sitting by her bedside, and Dale had gone to sleep, or I thought she was asleep. And uh, I just, I didn't lose it, but I just was having a moment, you know, there's just a moment. And the reason why I was having a moment is because I just knew that we were going to miss this woman. I mean, it wasn't like, I, it wasn't that her faith was in doubt, it wasn't in doubt that God's plan wasn't going to be fulfilled, but there was just this sense of loss. You know, there's just this deep sense that, wow, you know what? Those of us who have grown to know this lady, we're going to miss her because she is just an incredible person. And uh, evidently she wasn't asleep, and she kind of grabbed me by my arm, and she said, what's wrong? <laughs> and uh, I was like, oh, so, so, no, nothing. I said, just having a moment. Sorry, you know, I'm supposed to be ministering to her. You know how that works. And uh, she said, um, she said I, don't want you to, I don't want you to feel this way. I said, well, I said, it's just, I said, I'm so sorry. I, did, I felt so embarrassed because, you know, I'm supposed to be there ministering to her. And, and she said, Scott, I want to tell you two things that I want you to know, and I want you to never forget this. And by the way, she had had um, radiation and chemo to the point to where it affected her vocal cords. I don't know if you've ever been around somebody. And her voice sounded like music. It was the most beautiful thing. At that point in her life, you could just hear her voice, just the way that it would, the, 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 the way it would, would change pitch. It was just, it was beautiful. And she was speaking to me in this just beautiful, almost music-like toned voice. And she said, she said, Scott, I want you to remember something because you need to know this. She said, I want you to know that I believe in God. I said, oh, Dale, I'm, I'm not, I, yeah, I know that. I, I'm not upset because of that. I'm not questioning your faith. I don't want you to think that at all. It's just the She said, no, let me finish. Said, oh, sorry, okay. She said, not only do I believe in God, I believe God. She said, I believe, not only, I believe in him. I believe he's exactly who he says that he is. But I also believe in him. And she said, whatever he chooses to do out of this, I'm okay with it because it'll be the best. And that was it. She left me with that that day. And I was like, wow. And you know what? So many times in my life um, when I've faced difficulties, I've had to go back to this reality. Because if you want a real working definition of what faith is, what is a working definition of faith? A working definition of faith is the number one, believe God is exactly who He says that He is. Only God can define who He is. And He is who He says that He is. And that is true. Not only that, faith is to believe that God is going to do what He says that He's going to do. Even the things we haven't seen yet, the things that have not appeared yet, the things that, that are on the horizon, they're yet to be, He's going to do that as well. Faith says, I realize and recognize that God is who he says and he's going to do what he said that he's going to do. Dale said that's what I have and I watched Dale with incredible courage and honor face some of the most difficult circumstances that life can throw our way and she did it with such dignity and there wasn't a single person that was around Dale Strunkel that was around her life that was not changed by her. I'm one of them and she did it. You know how she did it? Through faith. Through incredible faith. We need that. 
Listen to me. You and I need that. Not just when we're sick. Not just when when all the, the chips are down. We need it every day. We need that kind of faith. That's the kind of faith that defines a community of people that changes the world. That kind of faith is not elemental. That kind of faith is essential. It's critical to who we are. So I want you to to look at this. If you're taking notes, write this in your outline. The only way to see things as they really are. By the way, faith is like glasses. Faith helps us to see things as they really are. See, when I have the kind of faith that I should have, that God is who He says that He is, that He's going to do what He says He's going to do, it causes me to see things as they really are. Not only that, It causes me to see things that I couldn't see otherwise. Things that would be invisible to my physical or fleshly eyes are visible when I view them through the lens of faith, when I see them. In fact, write this down. The only way to see things as they really are is to see them through the clarifying lens of faith. Then we can see the things that we cannot see. Several years ago, um, I went through flight school, many years ago, matter of fact, and I wanted to be a pilot. My brother and I had gone to see Top Gun. You know, anybody remember that movie? Da, 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 da. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, sir. And uh, we left that movie theater and we both joined. He joined the Marine Corps and I joined the Army. Neither one of us thought about it like we probably should have. But we did. And I wanted to be a pilot and so did he. Um, didn't occur to us that you have to have 20-20 vision. The recruiter didn't feel like that was important to point out either. And so my brother winds up in the infantry do, you, you, you know, shooting mortars. So, a lot different than a pilot, I'll tell you. Um, for me, I went on through flight training, but I didn't have 20-20 vision. And I'm going to tell you something. I cheated. All right? Just I'm going to tell you that right up front. This is a confession as much as it is anything. Um, I was at my final flight physical, and I knew that this is where my journey was going to end. This was literally the flight physical when I got there for training. I'd already passed a couple, and I won't tell you how I passed them, but I passed the vision part of a couple of them. But on this one, I was waiting in line. I'm like, they're going to finally catch me. They're going to realize that I don't have 20-20 vision. But lo and behold, we were standing in line just outside the guy that was in a little room with a little thing. You know, you put your head against the thing, and you look at there, and you call out the, the stuff. And I realized as I was standing in line, I mean, it was a moment of opportunity. I realized that he would tell them to read the same line. Would you read line six? E-A-D-G. Read line nine. Okay, now what do you see? An upside down E. Okay, you're good. I was like, could it be? (laughs) So I memorized it, standing in line. As I heard a couple of them go through it, I was like, I can remember that. And I sat down, and at first I said, I'm going to give it a real legitimate shot because maybe my vision isn't as bad as what I think. And put my head on the thing, and I look into the machine, and it was a blob backlit. That's all I could see. And I couldn't read any of the lines. He said, okay, would you read line six? And I did. I said, E-A-D-G-B, whatever it was. I read read it as they they had uh, been, I'd memorized it earlier. Line seven, I read it. And he said, what do you see? I said, an upside down E, although I just saw a blob. I said an upside down E, said you're good to go. And that's how I got into flight school. So your tax dollars at risk. <laughs> Multi-million dollar aircraft, I flew it and couldn't see worth a flip. Um, now back then, once you made it through flight training, you could get corrective lenses. But my wife and I, we were married. I was in the guard at this point, And we'd just gotten married and I needed to go get glasses. And she said, let's go get you some. But we didn't have the money for it. Eventually, we saved up a little bit of money. We went to Lens Crafters in the mall. I don't know if they're still there or not. But we went out there and she said, we're going to get you contacts. I was excited about it. I said, heck yeah, let's do it. The thought of putting something in my eye did bother me a little bit, but only remotely. And so we get there, and, and I, I put in those. I'll never forget. I finally got past the, you know, getting the thing, putting your finger in your eye, which is not natural. And I got those lenses in my eyes, and it was crazy. I remember looking around, and I was like, oh, my gosh. All these people have faces, and the trees aren't just like green blobs. They've got leaves on them. I was like, this is a whole, you know, those Internet things where you watch those people have the cochlear implants, you know, when they're hearing impaired, and they can hear all of a sudden. Or that person, they put that glasses on, they can see color, and everybody's like, oh, that's my, Stacey was like, oh, my gosh, you can see, you know. And, uh, yeah, it was the same kind of thing. When you and I participate in God and we put on his lenses of faith, believe it or not, it is no less shocking when we begin to see the world through a belief in God our faith and trust in Him. And all of a sudden, we begin to see relationships for different reasons and in different ways. We begin to see our circumstances, problems that you would... At one point, you're like, oh, that problem. But then you look at it through faith. Oh, whoa, yeah, okay. Temptation, there it is. Oh, yeah. Uh, No, oh, no, 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 no. All of a sudden, the world changes because you are seeing things through faith. That's exactly what God wants us to have. But I would dare say that the world, even the church especially, is filled with people who are not seeing the world through the lenses of faith. 
We're not seeing the world through God's corrective lenses. We're not seeing the world with with this crazy, confident belief that God is who He says that He is and that He's going to do exactly what He says that He's going to do. We're not seeing that. Therefore, our world is so muddy and it's so complicated and it's so difficult and we find ourselves tripped up with temptation. We find ourselves sidelined by obstacles. We find ourselves in so many different circumstances that we didn't have to get in if we just put on the lens of faith. And then all of a sudden we can, we can see as we should. So when we do that, when we live with the lenses of faith, when we begin to interpret life this way and see life this way, what are some of the things that are, are, are going to appear to us? What are we going to see? And let me just give you a few. This is not comprehensive. Let me give you a few things you're going to see. The first thing that, that you're going to see, and maybe it's not the first one, but it's something you're going to see, is that Satan, our enemy, is a liar. He's a liar. Some of you are going to say, did we already talk about this? We did, but I feel like you forgot. So we're going to go back and talk about it one more time. I'm not, I have no problem with repetition. That's how I got through school. Um, Martin Luther, who was the great Reformed pastor um, of many years ago, he wrote this little piece of poem, and I just have a portion of it. And it's from the poem, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And you could call it a hymn, whatever you want to call it. And I just want to read this to you, and I want you to listen to what he said, because it has a powerful truth in it. He says this, he says, The prince of darkness grim, he's talking about our enemy, We tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. This one sentence, though, listen to what he says. He says, one little word shall fail him. You know what's interesting about this? Martin Luther never defines what the word is. So he leaves scholars for years and years debating and fighting. What's the one word that causes our enemy to fall? What's that one word that that takes the horsepower out of him? And many, many theologians have tackled this idea because Martin Luther never came back and said, here's the word that you got to use. What's the magic word, man? He didn't tell us. And so a lot of people said, well, you know, it's obviously Jesus. And who would argue with that? Absolutely. Our enemy was defeated by Jesus. But let me ask you this question. Jesus defeated Satan... 2,000 years ago when he got up from the dead. You know that, and we know that to be true. But what's going to defeat Satan today in in the life that I live? And I believe the one word, and I may be a little off base on this, but I believe the one word that defeats our enemy more than anything else is this word, liar. Liar. You know how you defeat your enemy? By calling him a liar? You defeat him because the truth is he was defeated 2,000 years ago. So whatever he presents to you as a temptation, as an opportunity to shipwreck your life, all you have to do is look into that and go, wait a second, you're a liar. When he says, hey, you know what? This is going to be good for you when God's word says it's not. And you think, well, maybe it is because he says, yeah, sure it will be. You know what you do? You you put on your lens of faith and you go, "Uh, no, you're a liar. No thanks. When he tells you, hey, you can fly off the handle and you can give full vent to your emotions, you can blow up anybody that you want to, it doesn't matter because you have a right to do it, then you go, oh, no, that's a lie. No thanks. I don't know if you've ever played the game Jenga, but if you play the game Jenga, it's these wooden blocks you stack up together and you try to slide one out until eventually the thing becomes so unstable that whoever pulls out the last one, it just... This is that one block to your enemy that when you pull it out, his whole game plan just collapses when you recognize that he is a liar. He's a liar. So the next time your enemy says, you're not good enough, how are you going to respond? Liar. Next time he says, hey, you know what? Your marriage ain't worth it. Liar. You know what? There's been too much damage done. Liar. You do realize... And I've had this happen in counseling with couples. I've had couples come to me and say, Pastor Scott, you just don't understand. Too much damage has been done. Okay, you're not talking to me. You're talking to the God who made everything out of nothing. That's first of all. And don't you remember that this is the same God who raises the dead? You do know that, right? You know, this is the God that looks at dead and says, that's the best you got? You remember when Jesus goes to Lazarus' tomb? You remember that? He goes to Lazarus' tomb and everybody's like, oh my gosh. He's been dead four days. Remember his sister said, hey, by now he stinketh in the King James. I love that. Yeah, no, he's, it's bad. I mean, he's swollen up like a blowfish. It's summer. I mean, this dude, no, let's just... And Jesus says, roll the stone away. And if you'll remember, his sister says, whoa, no, um, bad idea. Now, let's don't do that. It's kind of like, you know when you go to the refrigerator and there's that Cool Whip bowl? And you think it's Cool Whip. And you've got your little something over here that you're at. You're like, oh my gosh, that's... You know, and you know how it makes that sound? You know, you're ready. But what you didn't know months ago, somebody in some sinister thing 
dumped leftovers into that Cool Whip bowl. And it's not Cool Whip. It has no indication on the outside that what's on the inside is a horror show. And you crack the top on it, it looks like a bad science experiment. Stuff's growing and there's that uh, smell. You're trying to get the lid back on it. That's what Mary and Martha are saying about their brother Lazarus. You break that stone open, man, everybody's going to be sick to their stomach because as much as we love Lazarus, we don't want to hang out with him now. You know what Jesus says? Roll the stone away. Is he intimidated by death? Is he intimidated by the death and the ultimate damage that Lazarus would have had after four days of death? Is Jesus intimidated by it? No, he's not. You know what he says? Lazarus come forth. And when he comes out, nobody goes, oh, whoa, Lazarus, dude. It wasn't Pet Cemetery. Wasn't like that at all. Lazarus comes out. He's fully intact, good to go. I think he smelled good. He says, hey, get those grave clothes off of him. So when you look at God and you say, God, there's too much damage in my marriage. There's too much damage in my ministry. There's too much damage in my family. Too much damage been into my life. I've got tattoos to prove and I've got this mess that I've made and I've got this history. I've got all this. You're talking to the God who raises the dead. You're talking to the God that is not intimidated by the damage that has happened in your life. You're talking to the God that says, here's what I need you to do. I need you to put on the faith lenses so that you might see this for what it really is. I am who I say that I am. And I will do what I promised that I would do. And all of a sudden, you see things differently. You see it for what it is. Your enemy, he's a liar. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Listen to, what, listen to what God says here. He says, for we live by faith, not by what? You've heard me say this before, but it's kind of weird. I don't think that the opposite of faith would be sight. Do you? I mean, I'd say the opposite of faith is what? Doubt? Unbelief, but not sight. God says, no, no, the opposite, the antithesis of, of faith is sight. In other words, faith is God's prescription for your perspective. He's going to change your life by changing the way you see things. And the only way that you can change, God can change the way you see things, is for you to see God the way you need to see God. You need to see Him for who He is. You need to see that He's going to do what He says that He's going to do. And so God gives us a prescription so that we can live by faith. Faith changes my perspective. It changes my sight. It changes my, my, my viewpoint. It changes things. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, the Bible says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has done what? Blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand the message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness, if they could see it, of God. And by the way, it's not just unbelievers who are blinded. Jesus proves that when he gives the parable and he begins to talk about it. He says, why is it that you go to your neighbor and you're trying to pick out what's wrong with their vision? they got a speck in their eye. Because you're trying to pick that out. But you know what your problem is? you got a big old plank in your eye you got a two-by-six up on your face. You can't see a thing. And you know what he's saying? Yeah, you can clap for that. Somebody go all in. Yeah. So, so what God's saying is this. He's saying, hey, he's not saying don't go help your neighbor. He's saying, hey, put on your faith vision first, and then you can see what's really going on with that speck. He says, you know, you get, your, you get your faith vision on first, and when you do that, all of a sudden now, your help for them is going to be accurate because you see things as they should be. Yeah, see, God's got something for us in this. It's, it's huge and how important that it is. But you know, the Bible says in that passage, it says that Satan blinds people. You know how he blinds us? Simple. He convinces you that God isn't who he says that he is. I mean, really? I mean, come on, that's kind of, that's old-fashioned stuff. I mean, what year are we in? You know, science. We've got science now that's changing their theories every day, by the way. You, did you realize that your children's textbooks that are talking about fundamental scientific truths, that, I mean, foundational truths, where life came from and all those kind of things, you know they're being rewritten like every couple of years now. You want to know why? Because it changes. If you were to rewind the tape and look at a textbook that was written 10 years ago, you'd make fun of it because it's like a nursery rhyme. But God's truth, by the way, incidentally never changes. God's truth is stuck to the same, to the same truth that it had from the very beginning. And God says, you know what you got to do? You put these on. You put on these faith glasses. You put on this faith so that you can see the things that you need to see. But the moment that Satan comes into our life, what happens is he convinces us that we don't need those. Take that off. I mean, and come on, that, those promises of God, Jesus is going to return, all that stuff. I mean, that's old-fashioned. Come on, you guys. I mean, what? We're, we're living in the age of Fox News and CNN. I mean, where real truth happens all the time, right? I mean, we're living in the age where 
some guy that's never had a job post something on the internet about truth and the whole world goes crazy. Yeah, that's when we're, we're living in just, we're filled with truth, aren't we? Yeah, you don't need these. You don't need, you don't need God's truth. Incidentally, when Jesus described himself, here's what he said about himself. He said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He said, I am the plumb line of God. You want to know what truth is? You compare it all to me. I'm the standard for which all things should be compared because I am the truth. See, we live in a world that's filled with information and deceit and deceptive things. God says, no, no, no. I've set the plumb line based on myself. I, I, am, I am the truth. And your enemy, the moment that he wants to shipwreck your life, he wants to convince you to take those, take those off. You don't need those. And that's how he blinds us. We take off our faith and we lay it down and the enemy has a heyday with it. He really does. Let me give you a second thing that you're going to see when you have the lenses and see the life through the lenses of faith. You're going to see that obedience is my part, but out, the outcome is God's. This is the most liberating truth in God's Word. For those of us who struggle with fear and anxiety and all this stuff we're trying to control, this is a beautiful truth. Obedience is all I'm responsible for. Incidentally, I, I challenge those of you who are Bible scholars, show me one commandment where God commands us to be in charge and in control of the outcome of anything. Show me one place where God says, it's your responsibility to figure out how this mess gets cleaned up. Show me that. You can't find it. You want to know why? Because that's God's work, not yours. You plant the seeds. It's God's responsibility to, to cause the increase. That's up to Him. You, you do the right thing. How that turns out, that's up to God. You're only responsible for doing the right thing. That's all. But you know what happens when you and I don't have this, these faith lenses on and we're not looking at life through faith? We're short-sighted. We're nearsighted. All we see is right now. And we're trying to control things. We look at it and we go, you know what? If we do the right thing here, gosh, that could be really... If I tell her the full story, I mean, admit, I'm not really lying, Pastor. I'm just not giving all the information. So you think God's good with that? See, your short-sighted vision when you don't have the lens of faith on your eyes says this. I better control this thing because I want to control the outcome. Faith vision says, I'm going to do what God asks, and I'm going to leave it up to Him. It's not my mess to deal with. It's not. You know what God has? He has all, you need to get this, God has all the resources of heaven to manipulate and deal with the outcome. I don't. I would rather live with a higher cost in the short term because I did the right thing to, than to live with the super high cost of the outcome later that says I'm no longer in harmony with God. Would you rather have God fighting for you, giving you His favor, or would you rather try to fix things yourself? Man, I'm going to say put on your glasses and say, whoa, hold up, hold up. We can't, we can't live like that. Obedience is our part. The outcome is God's. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 says this, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep His promises. And I want to compare two things that are really important because if there's anything lacking in the church today, I think it's faithfulness. And by the way, faith and faithfulness are fruit from the same tree. Faith and faith. I think faith, we struggle less with faith than we do faithfulness. Faith says, I'm going to do one courageous thing. And we, we don't have a problem doing a courageous thing on the spur of the moment. If it costs us just a little bit of time, a little bit of we'll do something pretty courageous. But what if you needed to commit the next 20 years of your life to it? Are you going to stick with it? That's faithfulness. See, faith says, faith says that, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump into this one thing. It might take me this one act of courage. Faithfulness says, I want a lifetime of courageous acts. See, faith is not that hard for us to get. Faithfulness is. It's like our gym membership. You know, January 1st, I'm concerned about abs, you know. I want to find them. Let's find my abs without an ultrasound. Let's see if we can find them. January 15th, after I've been a little while and I'm sore, I'm like, man, abs are overrated. You know, who, who needs an ab? I got an ab. I mean, singular. Who cares? I don't need all that. That's how we are in our, in our faith. Sometimes we'll have this courageous momentary act to do this one thing, but faithfulness of continuing on to keep it going. Incidentally, as I study God's Word, I see God using people primarily who are faithful, not people who just had faith for the moment. God uses ongoing. You realize Noah worked on that boat for a hundred years. That's faithfulness. I love the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer. I've shared it a million times. It's this one act of courage where they pick a fight with the Philistines and they win. And that's awesome. 
And you know what? If you want a schizophrenic life, then have faith for the moment, then not later, then faith for the moment, then not later, then faith for the moment, then not later. But if you want to have the kind of life that God can use, you want to have the kind of life that you most want to live, then be faithful. Stick with it. God should matter today. He should matter when it's not Easter. He should matter when it's not Christmas. God should matter when it's not the first of the year. God should matter when your life isn't in the ringer. God should matter not just on Sunday, but also on Tuesday or Monday, for gosh sakes. God should matter then too. God should continue to matter no matter what. Be faithful. Be faithful. Be faithful. Let me give you one more thing you're going to see. When you put on the lenses of faith, you're going to see what's missing God has. What's missing in your life? God has it. And by the way, God designed every circumstance, every problem, every opportunity of your life. You know how he designed it? With a hole in it that only he can fill. That's right. See, what we want is is we want God to give the fullness of all that we need for something to be accomplished. And we want God to give it to us in advance. God says, I'm not going to give you all that. I'm going to give you everything in completion except for the part that's going to require me. You want to know why? Because God's not interested in making you self-sufficient. God's interested in making you God-dependent. See, we're, we're, we, didn't, we didn't come to Christ so that we could take credit for building ourselves. We didn't commit our lives to Christ so that we could become the Savior of our own soul. We, didn't, we don't study God's Word, come to church, be involved in mission, reach out to people, carry the gospel. We didn't do that so that you and I can become self-centered. We did that so that God could be centered in everything in our life. And so God leaves a hole that only He can fill. There's always a piece missing to your puzzle. So when you find yourself at work and you you say, man, this project that I'm on, I'm overmatched for it. It's too much for me. Know this, that whatever's missing, God's got it. When you find yourself in a marriage that's that's run aground, it's really dry, and you say, man, I don't know how we're going to fix this. The part that's missing, God's got it. When you find yourself totally burnt out on confidence and saying, man, I don't know that I'm going to make this. I don't think I have what it takes. I'm not what I need to be. I can't overcome this temptation. What's missing in you, God's got it. God's got it. He's got it. See, your enemy, he condemns. Condemnation is for one purpose. It is to condemn so that you can destroy and tear something down. When we condemn a house, we say it's too far gone, too much damage, too bad, too too whatever. It's got to go. Let's level it. Your enemy, when he comes to you and he points out what's missing in your life, it's so he can, can condemn you. That's the reason why God says, judge not lest you be not judged. You know what judgment God's talking about? You're not allowed to condemn anything. That's not up to you. Because God's a redeemer and he's put you on the purpose and the mission of redeeming things. And you know what a redeemer does? A redeemer looks at the potential, not at the problem. Looks at the opportunity. And so God wants us to see that same thing. And so when when the enemy comes to you, he points out what's missing so that he can tear you down and say, you'll never be enough, you'll never have enough, you'll never get past this, you're always going to have this anxiety, you're always going to have this struggle. It's never going to work out for you because the enemy wants to bulldoze the life that God wants you to have. And you can listen to him or you can listen to God. By the way, just so you know, God is not a cupcake. So God doesn't come into your life and say, hey, let me make you feel good about yourself. Oh, it's not wrong what you're doing. It's okay. You had a bad upbringing, so you can be an idiot today. I don't care. Mom and daddy wasn't sweet to you, so you're, it's okay for you to be mean as heck to everybody else. It's all right for you to lie and manipulate. and steal. No, God doesn't do that either, by the way. But I want you to know this. The moment that God points out what's missing in your life, He simultaneously invites you to the opportunity for He Himself to feel what's missing. Did you get that? See, the moment that God says, wait, whoa, this is not how you can live. You say, well, God, I can't do any better. He says, you're right. But you can if I'm in charge. All things are possible for him who believes. So God said, let me show you this. I'll show you it in in a a verse of Scripture. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus is talking to a church, and this church thinks they got it going on, boy. Man, they think they're, they think they got it. Man, we have arrived. Boy, if you were to talk to them, they got their own t-shirts. They're looking sharp. Look at us. Best church in town is what we are. And here's what God says about them. And you don't realize that you are wretched, miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. That's... How about that for a survey from heaven, right? Huh? They don't realize it, though. See, at times in our life, we have no faith vision. At other times in our life, we have faith vision. And sometimes in our life, we have crazy-eyed vision. Let me ask you a question. Think about this for a second. Have you ever, have you ever been around somebody 
that you know their life's a dumpster fire. They've got a mess. It's just crazy. And you go and ask them, say, hey, man, how are things going on? They go, great. Everything's great. It's all, man, I, I'm, doing, I'm doing the best I, I could ever do. Man, how's your finances? They just filed bankruptcy Wednesday. Great. Dude, I'm, dude, I'm successful beyond measure. You wouldn't believe what I, Have you looked at my Instagram post? I am so amazing. Look, look at me. All you got to do is listen to me. I'll tell you how great I am. I'm amazing is what I am. And you go, what? See, faith isn't you making up a story. By the way, humanity has worn masks from the very beginning. When God came looking for Adam and Eve early on in the garden after they sinned, they hid. They hid. Because they couldn't stand what they looked like. They didn't confront it with God's goodness and God's grace. They decided to make something makeshift for themselves. They took fig leaves and they hid their nakedness with it. Mankind has always done that. And we'll do it. We'll go, oh, I'm good. <laughs> what you talking about? Man, I got a, got a new yacht. I got a, man, shoot. I mean, I, I got it going on. I've had this happen in counseling, and it's the darndest thing. You sit down with a couple and husband and wife, you know, and here they are. Husband's like, man, he's got smile on his face. Hey, man, good to meet you, Pastor Scott. We want to sit down with you and just do a little tune-up on our marriage. Well, tell me what's going on. The wife, it's like she had it scripted. She's ready. And boom, like a machine gun. She's like, gah, 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 gah. let me tell you what's wrong with this marriage. This dude here's a creep. And he's like, and she goes, this is all. She got 70. Let me, matter of fact, let me pull this out. I got 73 things. Number one, here's what's wrong. He does not lower the lid. Number two. And she's just got, she's ready. Yeah, and, and, she's, and, and the dude's over there like this. He's like, what? We're doing great. What are you talking about? Man, I, what do you mean? I filed for unemployment. I, everything's good. I don't know. I can't understand it. I've had it happen the opposite direction too. You know, you sit down and the, and the husband's like, Queen of the gargoyles, I'm telling you. She says, whatever. And she's like, what are you talking about? I, everything, I, don't I spend our money well? I mean, I, we got every pair of shoes we need. What are you talking about? She got, it's all good. Some ladies was a meddling, sorry. But, I was, what? Crazy eyes. So you don't, you're not looking through the lens of faith. You're looking through the crazy glasses where you're making up some kind of story about yourself. That's what this church is doing. By the way, you'll never ask God for what you lack if you keep pretending like you got it. See, pride is the greatest obstacle between us and what God wants to give us. That's the reason why God says, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves. I ain't got it. I'm struggling. Man, I, I'm scared. That's why I, I pretend. I uh, act like everything's good, but it's not good because I'm filled with anxiety. You know, ever since I was a little girl, you know, I, I haven't felt good about myself, so I've worked really hard to try to, you know, make myself feel good. It's humility. God says, man, I'm glad you said that. Let's work on that. The moment that we are willing to be truthful and unveil and take off the mask, that's where God is unleashed in our life. And for some of us, we're sitting here today, and we've got, we got our crazy glasses on. Some of you, you haven't been out of a relationship for five minutes. You're, you're in your 37th one this month. You can't understand what's wrong with them, <laughs> those crazy people. Every man I find is crazy. Uh, maybe not. It may, that, may not be the, that may not be the case. There might be another problem. But the truth is, until we understand that our identity is broken, if we're will, until we're willing to deal with that broken identity through humility and through confession and coming to God, realizing that what's missing He has, we'll never find wholeness and healing. We'll just have to put on a bigger show, build a better mask, and pretend more. He says, don't you realize that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blinded, naked? So God's just picked out what's missing. Now watch simultaneously. So I advise you to buy gold from me. He's not talking about gold. He's talking about the gold of God's truth, the gold of God's purpose, the gold of, God, gold of God's passion, the gold of God's lifestyle. He's saying, buy that from me. The, the gold of God's strength and peace and joy and happiness, real happiness, holiness. God says, buy that from me. So I advise you to buy that gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. God says, I'm not selling you a pyramid scheme. This is not a sham. What I offer you is something you can't get anywhere else. Then you will be rich. 
You'll be rich. Not, not this kind of rich. Not pretend rich. Rich. Real, real rich. He says, then you'll be rich also by white garments for me so that you will not be ashamed by your nakedness. In other words, God says, you know what? There's a lifestyle I want you to live in. See, when we believe God is who he says that he is, with such confident hope, it changes our behavior. We live differently. Also by white garments for me so that you will not be ashamed of your nakedness. An ointment for your what? Oh, wait a second. Why well, do we need ointment for our eyes? So you'll be able to do what? See. Is it possible that what you're seeing isn't accurate because you're not looking at it through the lens of faith? You know, your problems, no matter how big they may seem to you, if you don't look at them through the lens of faith, they'll be something that they're not. Your opportunities. Man, I have this opportunity. Man, it, did you know that if you don't look, that, look at it through the lens of faith, it'll become something that it's not? You'll see it for some. Your temptations that keep overtaking you. Your inadequacies, your misses. Did you know that if you don't look at them through the lens of faith, you'll see something that they're not? It's only through the lens of faith will you see the things for what they really are. How desperate we are to be those kind of faithful people. How important it is to see things the way God wants us to see them. Incidentally, faith is something you can ask for. Did you know that? There was a man that came to Jesus. and He's begging for his kid to be healed. And Jesus said, Nothing's impossible for him who believes. And he looks at the guy in the face. He said, do you believe that? And the guy was honest. You know what he said? He says, man, I don't, but help me with my unbelief. Help me with that. Did you know that the Bible says that you can specifically pray for more faith? When was the last time you said, God, listen, the way I see the world, the way I see relationships I'm in, the way I see the, the, what's going on in my life, my opportunities, the way I see things is kind of broken, God, and I can't see it the way I need to see it. God, would you help me with my faith so I can see it? Would you help me, Lord? Did you know that's a prayer God answers? And say, like, yeah, absolutely. Let me help you get those on. Let me, let me help you. How many blind people did Jesus cause to see? Do you think he did that because he wanted to be uh, an ophthalmologist? Is that right? I think so. Do you think he did it for that reason? No. You know why he did it? So that you might realize that God deals with vision. That's what he does. Let me give you one final thing. James says in, in James chapter 4, verse 2, he says, yet you don't have what you want. Because why? It's time to ask God for it. When's the last time you asked God to increase your faith? Because without it, you can't see what you need to see. Your life is going to be so confusing. I don't know if you've ever driven down a dark road and turned the headlights off your car. You know how hard it is to drive? That's how some of us are driving. Without, without the lenses of faith on in our life, it's so confusing. It's so complicated. It's so difficult. God says, ask for it. See, when you and I pray like that, that's where our faith meets God's abilities and God replaces what was missing. That's what he's offering us. That's, that's, that's what's on the table. That's what's on the table. There's a lot of things in life you can get. But man, the vision to see God for who he is and to believe that he can fulfill the promises that he's made. Game changer. For all of us, such an opportunity. Such an opportunity. So here's what I want to do. I want to pray with you. And I think some of us can probably be sitting in this room right now and say, wow, you know what? I may not have been looking at my life this way. I may not have run it through the filter of faith. I may not have seen things through the lens of faith. And, and you know what? We can make a difference. We can change. Isn't that cool about God? Get a do-over. I like do-overs, don't you? Do-over. Let's, let's try that again. Man, I've been, I've been missing that. You know what God says? Let's, let's fix it. Let's fix it. Stop pretending. Let's fix it. Let's get the lens of faith on. You know, one of the questions we need to be asking each other is, hey, you got your faith on? You know what? There's times I need somebody to ask me, hey, Scott, you know what? You, you're a little anxious about this. You're a little scared, a little nervous. You got your faith on? You need to put your faith back on, bud, because I don't think you're seeing it for what it really is. Put your faith on. Put your faith on. Some of us need to do it for the very first time. Put our faith on. Trust in Jesus. Give him control of our life. It changes everything. I'm going to ask you if you will, bow your heads with him. Nobody looking around for just a second. I want to pray with you and I want to pray for you. All right? If you're sitting here today and you say, Scott, man, I don't have a relationship with God through Jesus. I want to say this to you. It's impossible for you to put on the lenses of faith until you first trust Christ. Your first act of faith that unleashes the power of heaven in your life 
is to see Jesus for who he is. Jesus is exactly who he said he was. He is God in the flesh. He came and lived among us as, as a person, a man. He died on a cross for our sins. The penalty for my mess was put on him. He was placed in a tomb. On the third day, he was raised from the dead. And he is alive forevermore. And when we put our faith, we believe that that's true, that he is who he says. He, put our faith in him. The Bible says, we will be saved. If you're ready for that today, let's take that step. Let's trust that Jesus is who he said that he is. Let's put our life in his hands and let's experience brand new life, faith-filled life. If you're ready for that, just pray silently with me right now. Why don't you talk to God? I'll give you some words. Let's pray to him. Let's say something like this. Just say, Lord, today I realize that I need you in my life. I can't do this without you, God. I trust you. God, thank you for dying on a cross for me, giving your life for me. Thank you, God, for coming to me today and inviting me into a relationship with you. God, I say yes. I say yes to your forgiveness that you're offering me. God, I say yes to your purpose for me to live for. God, in the days to come, teach me how to live a faith-filled life as I trust you. Today, God, thank you for loving me. God, I offer this prayer, and I give you thanks in Christ's name. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, today, as we are here together, God, we are, we're just overwhelmed by your goodness, Lord. I'm, I'm thankful that you gave us a word like faith that we can understand how it radically changes the way that we see the world that we live in and empowers us to live at a different level. It causes us to see you for who you are, God, and that changes everything. But it also, not only that, it causes us to trust and have absolute assurance in the promises that you've made to us. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for the fact that you do point out what's wrong in our life, God. And you give us the opportunity through humility to turn to you, God, and turn away from it. And through that, God, you give us a chance to live differently. Father, thank you for these things. Lord, I pray for this crowd that's here today, God. I pray for each one, God. I pray as they leave this place, they might be encouraged. I pray that you might be with them in such a special way, God, this week as they began to put their faith on. They began to see things as they are. They see the lies of the enemy and say no to those. That they see that, that their part is obedience and, and your part is the outcome and they start living in peace. God, I pray for that this week, God, that they'll experience those kinds of things. Father, thank you for loving us like you do. Today as we leave this place, may you be glorified in our lives. God, we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, God bless you guys. Y'all have a great week this week. We will see y'all next week. Hey guys, we really hope you enjoyed that message. Here's a look at what's up next. Okay, so heads I propose to her, tails I don't. Order the buckler and shield and prepare for battle.